Happy 2024 and welcome back to Asset Horizon on Zero Books. A couple of years ago on Asset Horizon, we discussed the anti-fascism of Wilhelm Reich, reading his collection of essays entitled The Mass Psychology of Fascism, and I'll include a link to that show in the show notes. Since then, we have intended to go back and take a closer look at the psychological theories of Reich, his view on science and epistemology, as well as some of his theories, philosophical precursors. Today with us, we have Dan Lowe, who has long been recommended to me as an expert on Reich's work and who is a practicing therapist and counselor in London and whose work is informed by Reich's ideas, at least partly. And with that said, the ambit of our conversation today hopes to include a wide range of topics within Reich's life and his writing, but will pay particular attention to some of the practices and challenges involved with Reiki and therapy. Dan, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Well, thanks so much. It's lovely to be here. Um, yeah, it's always strange when you hear yourself described as an expert. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> well, you, on Twitter, you are Oregon One, so you are set up for that. Um, well, maybe you could just tell us a little bit about yourself, your practice, your background, and your familiarity with this work. Sure. Um, well, I'm... Um, I'm a psychotherapist. I'm based in London. Uh, I was a teacher previously, and I retrained in 2017. Um, I did an MA in integrative, uh, integrative relational psychotherapy at Roehampton University, and I started seeing clients in 2018. Um, the thing that led me to that, to retrain, was doing four and a half years of Reichian psychotherapy with a therapist in London, uh, Deirdre Goff. And that in itself came out of a long-standing interest um, in Reich. I wrote my dissertation about Reich in the 90s. Um, and well, when I was at university in the 90s, uh, which was, you know, it, was, it wasn't very good. Um, it was largely a rip-off of uh, Myron Sharif's big biography. But um, Reich has remained an interest um, since then. And I think I first came to him because I read something about mass psychology of fascism. Um, I'd always been interested in politics, and yet it somehow struck me as missing something, or being a bit, or, you know, the, the shallowness of so much politics. And a guy who was bringing me emotional and psychological into um, into politics that seemed worth reading and hearing about. So. Um, that was what first got me interested and then he cropped up in my studies and he's remained an interest ever since um and fine i finally got to do some writing therapy in uh started about 2000 no, 2013 uh, maybe a little bit earlier and um i found it absolutely incredible i found it um you know like you can take up all sorts of disciplines and they kind of do something and you have to work it and bodge things around i, f I found the psychotherapy that i did um really very immediate very powerful uh very changed very changed me a lot um and yeah and it was I'd regularly experience, I think, kind of vistas of health and happiness that I didn't know were possible. And that's my fascination, basically. And after being interested in Reich for so long, that was kind of strangely validating, you know? Um, I knew it was good, but I didn't expect it to be that good, but, but, but it was. And, well, that's, that's fascinating to hear. And I think that's something that our listeners, we, we recently did uh, an episode on a, a Freudian trained psych, mm -hmm. uh, psych, psychotherapist who has somewhat disavowed Freud, but is nonetheless uses some of the, uh, the methodology. Um, it's interesting to hear a success story as well. I would certainly like to get to that, but maybe we should get uh, an overview of, of Reich's theories, particularly this idea of orgon what the hell is Orgone and how did Reich attempt to ground his theories? I, I think one of the obstacles that some people have uh, with respect to taking Reich seriously is that there's a popular image of him as an eccentric who peddled a kind of pseudoscience, right? And he has this theory of orgasmic flows of energy. And in its caricature, it seems quite a bit like maybe 
like the qi of like Eastern or traditional Chinese medicine, or maybe something like mana. But based on, you had us read a couple of things. Uh, one was Morton Herskowitz's, Herskowitz's Emotional Armoring. And then you also had us read uh, the first two chapters of Reich's own Ether, God, and Devil. And what, what I found fascinating about that was, is, I mean, he, he really goes at lengths to defend himself as a scientist. I mean, one of the things about Reich is that he's arguably a very rigorous positivist, not to mention that he has his own theory of functional ergonomics, and it has what he thinks are two targets that are historically flawed, two theoretical dispositions, what he calls the mechanistic view of nature, and then the mystical view of nature. And maybe perhaps to start off, you could address like what orgone is, what what Reich was trying to achieve, and if it makes any sense to do so, like what are the kinds of psychological views that he's pushing back against? Basically, if you engage with Reich, you have to um, engage with his ideas about energy. And uh, he felt he had discovered an energy that he called Orgo. Um, now, and, and it, you could see that as an attempt to re rewrite um, a life energy back into kind of uh, Western Western biology, really, if you like. So, not a not dissimilar idea to chi or prana, but an attempt to sort of have a new biology that incorporated that, and and, and like he failed. Yeah, it that got him in having that energetic perspective. Um, was really the thing that, um, that got him that got him in legal trouble in the fifties in America. Um, I mean, it's a bit more complex than that, but I'll I'll I'll, um, I'll, call, I'll come back I'll come back to that if necessary. Um, but it was very clear um, that he felt all going was real. And if you're reading him, you have to read him with that in mind. You have to go, yeah, because you know, I'm not saying people should believe it, but it wasn't. It's, it's not a metaphor for like it's something that's that's, that's real and concrete that's uh, in us, um, experienced in therapy, right for it was present in the atmosphere as well. Um, just to go back a bit, he says if he discovered anything. Um, uh, the coastal stretch from which all the rest of his work developed was the idea of pulsation. And that's the idea of things contracting and expanding, things in nature contracting and expanding from cells um, to organs, to, to organ, or, organs, sorry, to um, individual humans. Uh, a question I'll often ask people in therapy is, uh, you know, do you feel quite contracted today? Um, and I see the therapeutic work I'm trying to do is trying to move him to a place of uh, expansion. And he's sort of in, you know, systems greater than us, in, in weather systems, for instance. So you've already got this um, this type, this mode of inquiry, um, which, unlike Western science, which specialises and looks at smaller and smaller parts, it links things up. It links things up and it looks for common principles of, across them. So already it's, um, yeah, anathema to, to, to kind of Western science. So he's got this idea of pulsation. And that, if he's, uh, if you're thinking about pulsation, you've got to say, well, what is pulsating? Um, and Reich would say it's all gone. It's a type of energy that is pulsating and it moves. And the, the, his psychotherapy is in a way is looking at where the organism might be blocked and contracted um, and where the energy is kind of bound and it's looking at freeing that, uh, basically. Um, does that, uh, is, is, yeah. And one of the things that, now I don't, it's, I, I don't expect anybody listening to take that on board or to um, to just believe that because I've asserted it so. Um, but one of the interesting things about it, it is that it was such a creative idea for Reich. It was generative of so much, um, so many insights, so many ideas, so much, so much creativity, um, as in the reading. You know, um, that's, you know, he's got some, some quite interesting, 
fascinating, sophisticated ideas emerging there from 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 this idea. And as you know, the caricature of Reich is that he, he, he he's mad. And I really just want to get people reading Reich and looking at him and kind of considering that he might not be, or that there might which doesn't say I expect people to believe in the reality of organ energy. I'm ambivalent about it myself sometimes, but more to sort of take him seriously as a thinker and thinking with this unorthodox idea can actually take you places. Um, an example of that might be with this idea of pulsation and looking for what Wright calls a common function principle across um, uh, across different realms. That idea of pulsation uh, in in human biology it kind of unifies lots of different processes so laughter uh crying um being sick vomiting uh orgasm um and even birth they all have a pulse of them obviously they're very different cysts they're very different phenomena but a Reichian would look at them and notice the pulsatory aspect and be thinking can for instance, could like the birth process maybe be improved or or be could a difficult birth be helped by uh, the idea of um, by allowing freer pulsation? Um, what happens in the therapy room if I notice that someone's breathing is quite contracted and I get them to breathe in a freer way? Their breathing begins uh, and, um, and I can get their breathing to pulse a little. What kind of happens? So it's an idea that I, I would argue in favor of it um just by looking at how generative it is and uh, yeah is that helpful that's great I, i'll just ask one more question to get the the others in here too and maybe to kind of shore up an argument to be an advocate for Reich here too. I'd like to repurpose an argument and analogy that we found in the Herskovitz book on emotional armoring. So Reich has this concept he calls armoring or emotional armoring, and it's one that is manifested individually, but there is perhaps even a sort of cosmic dimension to it where there's, you know, in the universe, forces go the to the limit of what they can do. You know, they express themselves in a full range of capacity, but there are times at which, you know, due to emotional trauma or, or any, you know, some kind of binding force, they cannot do that. And in the case of emotional armoring, you know, somebody has internalized trauma to the extent that they can't act in certain ways. And then that expression comes out in the form of various repetitions or habits, maybe, maybe habits the way that we use our eyes and hold our eyes or hold our body and so forth. And um, I, I don't know, part of me wants to say that it's almost incontestable that, you know, with respect to trauma, there's ways that we embody that. There's a certain physical dimension to it and, you know, that it enters into our body and then is expressed even unconsciously. Uh, the question is, you know, for, for us going forward is, is Reich's concept of emotional armoring and the theory of therapeutics that's entailed, is that sufficient to both diagnose and, you know, elicit some kind of quote unquote cure or, or release that energy? And, and maybe we, we have to simply talk practically about this. So if, if you want to talk, you know, you know, either in terms of what you have experienced inside the therapist room or maybe experiences that you have as a therapist. And then maybe we can work our way sort of back towards the theory and some of the problems or challenges that we may have with it. Sure. Um, do you want me to give a quick account maybe of what Armoury is? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, the most... Um succinct uh, definition I've heard was from my supervisor who described it as um, who said it's the um, it's the physiological side of emotional repression um, and this is an idea it tends to appeal to most people most people tend to get this you have an idea that your emotional range is a bit limited uh, it's, it doesn't feel as full as it could be and that's somehow bound up with our bodies and our expression and how our body expresses itself, whether it's breathing or movement or or, or, or whatever, or, or, or tensions that we're aware of. Most people seem to sort of resonate with that idea. Um, it doesn't require um, organ 
adapt for that for, for, for that idea to function. Wright writes about two sorts of um, armoring: uh, char the character logical and the muscular. And the muscular would be um, what's taking place on a bodily level. It might be a, a tight jaw, say for instance. Um, and the character logical will be the character attitude, like a tight jaw might express a sort of stubbornness or something. And a Reichian therapist will work on both uh, prongs of that um, of, of that um, of that fork, so to speak. Um, and this is the idea that is expressed in the diagram you get on the cover of all of Reich's books. You get two arrows emerging from a uh, an underlying uh, line, um, and that. that um, what that represents is how two uh, phenomena that, see, that seem uh, antithetical are actually uh, a unity. So psych and soma seem, seem opposed, but in Reich, they're part of the same living process. Um, and he, 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 get, he got that idea from dialectical materialism, actually, from his Marxist states. Um, two things that seem in antithesis but are actually, but are actually a unity. Um, and psych and soma is one of them. Character, uh, character armor, mus muscular armor is another one. And I do actually find that quite a useful idea um, when I'm working with people. I might. I have some patients. I have some clients who I don't um, work with physically at all, but I still regard myself as working on their character armor. Um, and I have some. I, I have some clients who I work with. Quite a lot physically, um, and I regard that as working on the muscular armor. But it's still the same thing. It's still um, trying to free up uh, what Wright will probably call movement. It's trying to free up some uh, expression and movement. Could you just give an example of a common, uh, like, malady, problem, pathology, as you might see it, that somebody comes into therapy with and like what is a particular approach that you, you have to dealing with that? Um, do you want me to give you an example from my own therapy? Uh, if you don't mind, or you can yeah, create a hypothetical yeah. based on one that you've had. Yeah. Um, well, we, I've used this anecdote before, but it, it's, it's quite a handy experience to have because to, that, that I had because it's quite anecdote size sized so to speak and um i was working with a german therapist um in a kind of open workshop situation a, a retreat um and she was working on my jaw um and she got me to uh bite um uh, a towel um at one stage and just you know not, not really hard but just just you know expressing some aggression through my jaw um and the session went on for about it wasn't just that it was loads and loads of other moves as well and it went on for about 90 minutes um and at the end i felt at first i felt a little bit mm, didn't really experience anything particularly amazing um i wonder what happened there um but then i noticed um, that my jaw felt smaller um so that's interesting. And then I further noticed uh, an attitude change. And I felt like I didn't, um, and this was felt physically, and I'm going to translate it into words, but that was, um, I felt like I didn't have to defend myself anymore. So I just felt not only was the, it wasn't like I dropped a defense, it was just like I didn't need to defend myself. So what that tells me, what I would hypothesize from that, that there was a kind of aggressive defensiveness that was just being carried in my jaw, um, maybe pushing my jaw out slightly or tensing my jaw somehow. And she got me to release that. And the, and the, release, of a, the release of a somatic tension got the, um, made the character attitude of defensiveness drop away. So, yeah. Um, well, thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah. You know, that's that's a personal share, so that's mm -hmm. important and, and and intimate as well. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, Adam or Will, by all means, hop in. I mean, yeah, thank you so much for sharing that, Dan. I mean, the, I mean, like, I think every, every time I think about Reich, I always think of not so much of 
because I have I'm I'm not a Reichian, but I have some strong sympathies, particularly especially for the, the early uh, mass psychology stuff, particularly because I remember once when I was oh God, I can't remember how old, how old I was, but it was 2016, and I went to this exhibition. Um, it was called the Institute of Sexology, and it was just it was the int- introduction to the field of sexology. And then I picked up this one book on oh, this must be a sexy book by Wilhelm Reich. I just sat in this weird box, cool. And I open it, and it's a discussion of the Soviet Congresses of like nineteen twenty eight and nineteen twenty nine. And I think it's good that you brought up the dialectical materialism aspect there because it's not so much that Reich isn't weird, so much as the rest of the things we think of in sort of theory, philosophy, science that aren't weird actually are. I mean, this idea of pulsation. Um, this this is the dynamic critique of mechanism that goes all the way back to anyone after Newton. In philosophy, we have it from Kant to Schelling. Kant has a theory of ether. He thinks that towards the end of his life that the conditions of our experience of ourselves are this thing called ether, and we are ripples in its energetic process. We don't. So, I mean, Kant's wrong about a lot of a lot of things scientifically, but you know, in terms of the history of uh, the weirdness and also just the description of ergonomic functionalism functionalism his idea of trying to find a, a path or a non-dualistic path between the mystic and the mechanical that happened in the 20th century that was called cybernetics um, in which we assign various things functions but whatever you put amongst those functions wasn't named whereas for reich it was it was all gone and so, so no, i just found it really fascinating just going through that that axiomatic i mean th- one question I have in terms of the contemporary reception of Reich, I know there's been in one side there's been a move to reappraise Reich as a scientist because um, there's a brilliant book uh, by James Strick, who did like the archival research and went into like Reich's early experiments on um, not orgone but um, ele- yeah yeah bions, elect- basically trying to do beginning of life studies and inventing actually some well coming up with some really fascinating techniques in electron microscopy which we still haven't replicated yet but there's definitely a phd in there somewhere but there's also this contemporary side of the not not the weird but more sort of the the, the marketable weird you know the the the, the crystals the the weird, those weird sort of sparkly black jewelry things that charge up you can, yeah if anyone's in london you can go to greenwich market there's a london orgone store do they sell those boxes no but <laughs> i just want to ask what, what you thought of the contemporary reception of reich across these sort of two poles of reappraisement and kind of kitsch i guess <laughs> i well I've, I've, i mean you know you can probably guess um i would much more align myself with jim strict than um some crystal shop selling organoid pyramids or, or whatever um but this, I suppose, one thing I'd say about the the all the organite and all, all that stuff, it's it's never really, there's never any rigor around that stuff. There's never there's not people doing well. Maybe there are, you know, maybe there are some people doing experiments, but it seems like a pretty kind of independent new age marketing gadget. Um, end 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 of the market, and it and it sits alongside everything else from you know from dazzling mods to tarot cards to whatever, and it's just another bit of frippery. And it's like it's like well, you know, okay, I don't necessarily hate it, but I don't see I, there's nothing there that really interests me. Whereas Jim Strick's work, um, that that book is incredible. And I think it's the most, I think it's the best book on Reich um, since his death. Um, largely because he's had access to the um, the archives. Reich um, asked for his archives to be closed up 50 years after after, after his death. So they only opened in 2008. Um, and that's more of the kind of work that I'd like to see. You know, stuff with stuff with um, stuff that takes it seriously. One of the things about Reich as eccentric, as an eccentric and a lunatic, he's quite safe. You know, we know about this guy; he was mad. One of the things that really gets on my nerves is, um, like newspapers, like the Guardian, they they take up Reich and they write about him, and I think they almost see him as their own because he was pro-sex and anti-fascist. But they won't take his ideas actually seriously. I wouldn't dream of reading a book by him. Um, 
I can't remember how I got onto that point, but um, it's always good to slag off the Guardian. I hope you agree. Um, <laughs> so, so it, yeah, the only down, the only thing that makes me sad is that um, Jim Strick's book. I don't know how many it's how many copies it sold or how widely it's read, but I don't really see signs of a wider. Reappraisal mm. of Reich, you know, maybe a, maybe a little mm. bit, not much. I mean, the only sort of recent book I can think of that even deals with Reich in sort of popular cultures is, is uh, Olivia Lang's book, yeah. Everybody. And I, I haven't actually read that. I don't know how much of a Lang, of not Lang, Reichian uh, sort of focus it has. She, she, um, I wrote a long thread about it on Twitter, slagging it off because I don't like it very much. And she, um, takes a standard position on Reich, which is like, um, oh, he was mad. Um, he was he was eccentric. And also, when you know her sources, you can see it's actually pretty shallow. She borrowed most of her, she didn't do any original research, and, and most of it is borrowed from um, a book called um, Journeys in the Orgasmatron by, I can't remember the name of the author, but it came out a couple of years ago by some, uh, London Review of Books guy, um, which is also, yeah, which is more of the same, you know. Um, right was mad. Um, why I wanted to get you guys and anyone else, you know, reading right is you, you read like A Forgotten Devil and, and you think, well, there's something going on here. This is there's active intellectual work here, that, um, and there's original ideas here, and yeah, which Lang's book, no, doesn't doesn't really do that. It, it says, uh, yeah, oh, he's he was he was interesting. Um, he was an interesting psychotherapist. Uh, the body stuff is good. All the energy stuff. Um, he was mad, and yeah, it's a pretty standard standard line really the, the other thing i'd say about that book jim strick was joking and he said um i'm gonna do a scientific biography of reich um how do i get it down from a projected 1500 pages to uh, a mere 500 um lang's book is 300 pages long about 20 percent of it is about reich so you know and it's written in a light poppy paperback style so yeah it's it's not that deep really so there's one thing that i think is so we've been talking a lot about sort of energy and pulsation but not about the object with which reich is going to sort of tether a lot of um historical and i know we're not supposed to say philosophical because right it's like very clear it's like oh, I'm, what i'm doing is not philosophy um but let's just say like psychosocial uh he's gonna tie a lot of his psychosocial conceptual critiques to this notion of like staticness of uh whether it's the absolute when he when he sort of slashes at kant or um you know um when he, I mean, he essentially does the same thing to Schopenhauer, which he calls like a disaster. <laughs> Schopenhauer in philosophy is a disaster, um, and and all of this he he ascribes to a kind of um, everything from uh, you know the bad conscience that comes from uh, you know internalized absolute morality to the notion of inherited guilt. These things to to the 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 notion of the absolute. Uh, all of these things are kind of tied to um, the static or uh, this kind of strange immutability. You know, he puts he puts the uh, there's there's this great uh, very uh, I think in the first chapter there's this um, there's this diagram of the realms of human thought, and um, he puts. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, he puts the um, this concept of blame in everything. So in the in the in the life element, heredity is to blame. In the cosmic problem of existence, um, like sin is to blame. 
So I'm wondering, uh, you know, whether it's guilt or the the stasis of a kind of um, you know essentialist biologization of of the human being to even just the immutability of the evil will of man. There seems to be this interrelation between the static and the mobile, and how how does in practice how does this inform a Reikian as they navigate um, sort of the the fe- like what what do you isolate with like an analysand as being the static problem versus trying to move towards this more mobile um, approach? Well I, well, I would say um, probably an easy way to get your head around that is to take it back to the body and to think about um, what does it feel like when I tense my stomach and keep my chest still? Um, what does it what, what does it feel like? Um, and probably going to say it feels it feels a little bit unpleasant so what i do a lot is i try and mobilize people's breathing i try and get get the movement to return and everybody breathes differently and breathing is as kind of personal as handwriting in 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 a way when you spend a lot of time looking at it um but one thing i would um I would pretty much always be trying to do is kind of see what happens when the breathing starts to move. Um, I'm often quite surprised at how rapid, with my own breathing, um, how, how rapid the changes in emotion can be. Three or four breaths, and yeah, things things start changing for me. Um, and in clients, not all the time, but in clients where I do manage to mobilise their breathing and get them to, and get them to move a bit, that's often the way in which you begin to start the sort of snowballing process of emotional emotional change. Um, and looking at specific points where um, where you're held, um, I have a lot of tension here, for instance, like right, right at my diaphragm. Um, and when I'm going through difficult things, it becomes more and more and more tense. Um, and I, I feel the sense of paralysis as something very, very embodied. So something I'll, I'll, I'll regularly try and do different exercises to try and move that. Um, and at times I've felt just kind of new possibilities of health open up because I've managed to get that moving, um, because I've managed to get my diaphragm moving uh, consistently sometimes it's the sensation things just drop away problems and worries just kind of yeah they fall off um it was it's one of my experiences in in therapy of um consistently going for uh, you know four and a half years and probably you know 99 times out of 100 um having that experience of having going in with something quite negative and feel and after a session feeling this new sense of spaciousness and happiness and lack of pressure so does that answer the question at all yeah yeah no that's exactly what i you know because what i don't want to do is ask these questions and then say oh well it's quite fascinating that like nietzsche and bergson were both important to the vitalist tradition like no that's nonsense that's not what we're here to do right so what what i want to try to to try to navigate is how um, um, Reich is kind of isolating the history of thought as something that he can turn into a symptomatology that he can then deploy into into the um, into the room with his analysand um, and like oh go ahead. No, I was going to say he's working on several levels because there's the there's the earlier work. Um, which is the um, the, um, the psychotherapeutic work, but Godi from the Devil is more of a kind of you know philosophical statement. Um, it's more of a kind of uh, this is what happens if we take these ideas out into out into the um, the social world and start to build theories and ideas upon them. You know, so one of the things about Reich is he's, he's very kind of um, intellectually promiscuous and he doesn't really respect boundaries. Um, he kind of strays wildly across all sorts of different fields. Um, and he, he talks about it quite clearly at some point. He says he's just following the logic of his research, but 
<clears throat> that's why he's gone from um, psychotherapy to microbiology, um, from microbiology to meteorology, um, from uh, from you know from observing fascism to um, this this quite philosophical work. He 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 he. he he consistently is following his own his own internal logic, which if you go with him, you can follow. But I don't think it does him any favours um, if you look at the amount of ground he covered. Uh, if you're trying to build the case he's a madman, um, then just looking at all the different fields he um, dipped into um, kind of lends evidence to that, I guess. I think we'll probably move on to what we would consider a few critiques of Reich, or at least question the methodologies a little bit. But perhaps even before I do that, I think, well, there's a sort of relatable anecdote that I have. I, I had been in uh, Jungian therapy, like in my early 20s, and I think I had some success with it. But it wasn't until maybe a few years after that, that I had gone to a very strenuous very physical kind of yoga class uh, where one of the moves, if you're a yoga practitioner, perhaps you know it, it's called Ustrasana, the camel pose. It's where one is on their knees and they bend backwards and compress their lower spine. And a feeling that is often evoked by doing this is a kind of sadness or overwhelming sort of um, like a melancholy or ennui kind of feeling, but it also releasing it too. When you, when you come out of the compression, you tend to to release this feeling. And sometimes I would I would experience having a dry sob or even like maybe a tear roll down my cheek. And I didn't go to yoga necessarily for well, I'm going there for the emotional benefits or the psychological benefits. But I noticed over time that you know, developing this relationship with a kind of co contraction and dilation of different parts of my body, I was slowly, um, unconsciously putting myself through a kind of therapy. Um, and I, I mean, I think there is one way in which I'm looking at Reich's theory, and I'm like, there is something there. But on the other hand, there is this issue about what I call the therapeutic tableau, where, especially if we read uh, Morton Herskovitz's book, um, the, the picture that he presents of, of Reich's therapy could be pretty unnerving to somebody com coming to it for the first time. It, and, you know, correct me if I'm mistaken, it involves an Alisans lying down on a couch in some cases, either completely nude or, you know, just in their underwear. And the analyst going around palpating parts of their body, looking for reactions, looking for changes in skin color and breathing and so forth. And one of the epistemological challenges, as, as I see it, is that bodies are so different, right, and react so differently to so many different things. You know, the question of disability comes in as well, because, you know, there are particular issues that might be, you know, uh, physical or health issues that somebody might be experiencing that could be immediately overcome with, you know, breathing exercises and so forth. But if there is some contraindication or some other symptom there, you know, it could per perhaps the ther therapy could exacerbate that condition. H how does a, a Reichian therapist navigate those problems? Um, Herskovitz was um, Reich's oldest surviving student, so presumably trained with him directly. Yeah, I'm pretty sure he did. Um, he died, in, I think, in 2018, and he was like, you know, 90 plus. Um, so he would have had a kind of transmission almost from Reich, which would be quite, um, you might call old school. And Reich was a medical doctor, and he, where he actually fell down was he, <clears throat> he wanted. Um, um, he only wanted medical doctors to train as therapists, and as you can imagine, that Venn diagram is fairly small. Um, so that's one of the things that kind of handicapped um, working therapy in the states. Um, but yes, I, I think if you understand work as a doctor and coming with that kind of um, with that kind of background, it does make more sense that he might have seen patients in patients in states of partial undress. I mean, I don't work with that. I don't work like that. Um, I wasn't worked on like that. Um, and there's two issues of... 
it's the issues of disability. There's so many, this therapy has changed so much since Reich's day, since the 50s. Um, one of the things, um, probably one of the most significant kind of um, significant kind of changes is what I'd call the kind of relational turn, um, where the importance of the therapeutic uh, relationship is really brought into therapy and, and really highlighted. Um, and some later kind of, I suppose, post Reichian therapists have. Uh, there's a guy in the UK called Nick Totten, who's does a whose type of therapy is called embodied relating. Um, where he's thinking not just about breaking down character armor, which is the kind of thing you get from Reich. He's thinking about the nature of the relationship between the uh, therapist and, and, uh, and therapy. Um, there's also um, Reich was writing before. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with Carl Rogers at all. Um, Carl Rogers, I see Rogers as kind of reacting to Freud and getting away from the very sort of complex intellectual formulations you get with Freud and getting back down to um, being with uh, a, a particular client. And he, um, there's a non directivity uh, with Rogerian uh, person centered counselling where you don't direct, where you try and elicit uh, from the patient. The idea is that. Rogers said something, I can't remember the quote exactly, but he said something like, the, the patient knows exactly what they need. Um, and that's a kind of, uh, that's a philosophical kind of difference with Reichian therapy, which can be quite directive and interventionist, um, as, as opposed to assuming that the patient knows what they need. And, and in practice, I would switch between the two. You know, I would switch between the two modalities. I, will, I, I, I certainly don't assume um, I know exactly what someone needs and um, I'm not going to listen to their feedback. Um, that would be uh, dreadful therapy, or, you know, I think fairly obviously. Um, but I might try a little bit of direction as well. I might be, well, you know, what is it like if you breathe differently? What is it like if you try and... Um, If you lie down and as you're lying on the couch, uh, as you're lying on, on the couch, is, if you uh, say, for instance, push your feet down and raise your hips, what does that kind of do? Um, so, in practice, I tend to switch between the two. As for disability and difference, um, again, it's the time Wright was writing. Um, most of the psychotherapeutic stuff was written in the 30s and 40s, and 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 it, it, it reflects the values. Uh, of that day the idea of writing about um uh, a person of color their experience of therapy just didn't happen i mean homosexuality was still was still illegal so writing about a queer experience just no yeah uh, it, it doesn't happen but in body psychotherapy generally i think there's a movement to um uh, to think about those kind of concerns. Um, I sent you a link to Nick Totten's uh, latest book, which is all about difference. And um, I'm, I'm pleased to see both, both, both those kind of things emerging. I, w I wouldn't take um, uh, Herskovitz as absolutely <laughs> representative of um, contemporary practice. I mean, you know, we were joking before the... Uh, before the recording started, but there's a couple of bits in that book that are like, if I wanted to get struck off, that's what I would do, <laughs> you know. Um, yeah. Yeah, and we'll we'll go ahead and we'll put a link to uh, Nick Totten's book in the show notes. Yeah, that that'll be a good one for folks. Yeah, Adam or Will, feel free to hop in. It's it's particularly important, exactly, to dad, to navigate that tension because also just to think about the historical context in which Reich was writing in, also from sort of the side of he's being chased by fascists throughout Europe at this point. You know, he's the only author to have his work burned by both the Nazis and the, the United States. Um, you know, it's, I mean, even you talk about the, the writing about the psychotherapy of the queer experience, that, you know, there was some writing that happened, but that was the, the Institute for Sexual Wissenschaft. That was, that was Hirschfeld and that was all burned and he, 
you know, died in exile in Paris. So there is definitely a, a restrictive tension there between sort of public acceptability and sort of the novelty of what he's writing there. And I mean, it, in terms of Wright Kim's Wright's writing, particularly in the stuff you suggested for us, there's there's there is that definitely that, that tension. Which I think you, you suggest that you navigate by sort of going between sort of the Rogers and the Reich sort of modality, which is between this, 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 this constant rallying against normalization. So you know, um, what Reich describes in I quote, you know, he says the great era of Homo normalis, because conceptual M is to believe in normality, and I think this is kind of one of the most radical things about Reich, and. Yet when we get to Herskovitz, there's this tension there because in deconstructing normality by looking at the body, the way they look at the body is already sort of coloured by normality as such. So maybe, for example, gait analysis, you know, or just like looking at, you know, they're comparing the body, like where is it tense in compared to what? And they're comparing it to the standard. And so I think navigating that tension is interesting, particularly because what you mentioned about how medicalized early Reichian therapy is. And if anything, it seems like the tension actually isn't with science in the sense, but, it's, but with medicine, or with the history of the very strict categorizing, very normalizing power of medicine as such, and what body that presupposes. So would you would you agree with that to the extent that there's a sort of a tension in Reichian therapy, not necessarily between the scientific aspects, because we have the James Strick, we have the experiments, we can, we can retry them actually now the archives are open, but more so about the tension between the therapeutic relationship and the history of medicine itself. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but I, I think I'm... I wouldn't confine that just to writing therapy. I'd say that's true of therapy in general. There's a tension, like, to me, that had come down to, um, like, medicine is basically his body of expertise, right? You know what to do. Um, so much of therapy is about not knowing. Um, and if I know about a patient's experience, I should be, I, that's something I should be suspicious about, about myself. If I'm more expert on someone's experience than they are themselves, then that is, um, yeah, that's something to. But I do not trust. But I would not trust about myself. So I'd say there's a tension between unknowing uh, as a positive value in psychotherapy and versus the certainties of medicine. Yeah. And I think also the question of the history of because it's not just and 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 reich actually does a, a decent job articulating this right when he says that there is actually some sort of he gives an account of the development of the sciences you know very quickly in a few pages um it's not just the history of medicine um you know it's a history of a particular kind of norm and the set of objects that that are in relation to that norm. You know, what does it mean to be, you know, uh, it's very different to be a normal subject under pre and in, like early industrial capitalism and, you know, 21st century post industrial information, you know, uh, imperial core <laughs> capitalism, right? The two very different kinds of norms because there are different modes of social reproduction and everything. So, you know, the field of problems that the analyst is going to have to address are going to be different. Um, you know, and this is why I think there's a fundamental difference between Reich and Freud is, you know, as, as um, Adorno describes Freud as like a, a symptomatologist of capitalism, right? Um, Freud seems deeply dependent on, on the bourgeois family. Right and a, a transhistoricality to it that has to be you know uh, placed over, uh, and this will be you know the target of critique for everyone from um, you know Felix Guattari and so on. Um, but for for Reich, he's really trying to look for not a substance, right? He's not looking for like a basic substance upon which he's going to hang his hat. But again, it's this, it's this dang motion. <laughs> like, I, I'm stuck here. I don't like, and, and, um, you know, so, so the way in which this, this motion is sort of the, like I, for some reason, I'm more interested in the buy on 
than I am in, in the in the Oregon. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, let's like let's put it uh, another another let's like theoretically prop up another world, right? Let's say let's say Reich actually had the the capacity and time to do the kind of research that he did. Um, you know, regarding I think it was plant life, right? That he was focusing on. Um, and let's and and like how would that have have um if he was able to shift his focus rather than from the apparatus of the orgone to this more um sort of bio uh i don't know bio vital kind of thing going on with the with the bio how would that have informed do you think his his approach to practice um i think it did inform his approach his approach to practice um I think he talk, he draws very clear analogies. Um, I can't remember where off the top of my head, but between the pulsation of uh, amoeba and, uh, and, and, and bions with um, um, with you know the, the bodies of uh, the analans uh, um, in um, uh, in, the, in the therapy room, he he um, is very 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 clear about that um he talks about um so for instance amoeba um encountering toxic substances and recoiling from them uh, and he talks about that as a type of pro as a type of proto armoring even a type of pulling away and a, and, and a hold a holding in um and also if you do ever see any video of bions um I don't know, in terms of talking about movement, they have a dancing quality. It's really strange. They look like life because they are they are, they are moving. Um, yeah, it, it, it sounds a bit. It sounds yeah. Maybe I'm falling into the trap of um, Reichian craziness. Possibly just uh, you, you can't end. You can't help but end up there when I'm talking about. Uh, microscopic organism dancing, but um, it, but that's what it looks like. Um, yeah, and I suppose for anybody who wonders what on earth we're talking about now, um, the bions were, um, Reich ended up, um, he wanted to see if his orgasm formula, uh, which is his, his, formula, his formulatic representation of this of charge and discharge, he wanted to see if that. Was a fundamental life. Um, he, he wanted to see if that was a fundamental part of the life process. So he started experimenting with um, microbiology and organisms, and he examined things at this huge level of magnification, but much, much higher than was the standard in in the day. And he examined um, living tissue rather than tissue that had been made, um, or living tissue and, li and, and uh, living plant matter rather than things that have been made, um, uh, that have been stained. Um, and he found these uh, things he called the transitional, um, what's the word he uses, the transitional objects maybe between the living and the non-living uh, called bions. And I know a variety of people who've repeated his experiments and I can send you some video if you like. Um, they yeah, we'll add that to the show notes too. Yeah, we would definitely love to see that. One thing that I thought was fascinating about Reich's theory is that there's a through line that goes not through the practice, not only into science, but into politics as well. And, you know, certain cognitive beliefs that people have bring to bear on their, their physical condition. And I was wondering if you see, or like with the analysands that you work with, is there a level to which that you have to work with them at a cognitive level beyond just the um, the physical stuff that you do, and 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 how does Reich's theory sort of play into, for example, like okay, we're working on the body, we're working on loosening the jaw and so forth, but then we're going to investigate maybe how this is impacting certain ideas that I have about my immediate family, for example, or the uh, the social system, the socio political system within which we live. Uh, maybe is it, can you make a comment on that? Like what what have you seen? on the ground well people um people's ideas about the family and the family um configurations they find themselves in they certainly change in the process in, in the process of therapy 
I don't really, <clears throat> I don't really see as much of a link between the immediate social, political, and um, and what people are, and what people are exploring in the therapy room. It tends to be more because. Oh, armoring or however we want to frame people frame frame people's difficulties um it seems to come together in the in the, in the early years in the, you know the, the kind of the freudian sort of infantile um and the, then the exp and, and the experience of the family growing up so i would say that that's a more family dynamics are more likely to emerge um rather than immediate social social political ones if that makes sense um yeah and people and, and, and people's um and, well one of um, one of the things that sometimes happens doesn't happen all the time but um one of the interesting things that, that can happen that points again to the links between psych and soma um is the recovery of spontaneous memories um people sometimes um as they're breathing, memories will just emerge spontaneously um, without necessarily any prompting from me. It's just things that um, had to come out. We'll just we'll just uh, bubble up, and people will start sharing them with me. Uh, it's quite amazing when that happens. Actually, I remember the, the first time that happened with me and a client. I was like. I wouldn't say I was surprised, but I was like, "Wow, um, that, that's pretty. That's pretty. That's a pretty amazing thing." Um, I would draw. I wrote, I wrote a Twitter thread about this, drawing a loose analogy between um, breathing and breath work and um, free association, um, because uh, free association is about you know, as you know, is about. Um, using a uh, using spontaneity to get to uh, the unconscious to present itself um i would argue uh, that breath work you can see working with the breath you can also see as a kind of free association because it's a kind of it's a way in which um things can come free and rise to the surface um yeah i've seen that i've, uh, I've seen that a number of times what does Reiki and therapy do when it comes to things like habits, obsessive compulsive disorder, or what they call obsessive compulsive disorder, or even just like drinking or smoking? How, how does that relation relate to uh, Reich's concept of emotional armoring? I, I might try and think of that as in a um, as being a particular presentation of armoring, but I don't necessarily know what I would work with a um with a what well, i would work with that in that way i might i might for instance use a sort of person-centered approach and and and, and um with sort of ocd stuff because people are so used to um running into criticism because of it and um so used to criticizing themselves my sort of way into it would probably be to try and normalize it and to try and depathologize it um which I, I could i could twist that around and i could fit it into uh, an arm an armor in a writing frame if, if i wanted to but i would probably be i would begin there but the, the, the thing is it, it, Like the standard ideas um, that animate practice, but when you're in the room with a client, um, something an old um, therapist of mine said to me years ago has always stuck with me. And she said, you've got to learn to be the therapist that that particular client needs. Um, <clears throat> so that might mean not doing any working ideas whatsoever. I mean, re rejecting that completely. I've had clients who said, oh, I don't want to do any of the physical work, thank you. Um, so I'm not fine. <laughs> yeah, let's not do that. Um, I might ask them why, 
and I might say, what are your reactions to, to, to the physical work that we've done or, or um, what are your feelings about doing that? But, um, yeah, I, I, practice, I guess, can be so kind of um, protean. It's hard to get a, a, it's hard to have a standard, this is what I do. I would say I, I'd be a worse therapist if I had a, this is what I do. Um, kind of answer. I've 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 a heavy orientation towards the body and towards um, and getting people to work with their breath, but it's not all that I do. Um, I think that's probably where most people get, take a stand back a bit from Reich in terms of when they think of the image, they think of you know Woody Allen's your Gasmatron, and they think of especially especially with that's the thing quacks know what they what they they know what you need because they're, they're trying to sell it to you whereas reich reichian's experiment reich is experimental uh, general sort of open I mean, well, he's, he, you know, it's, i think james strich once described him as a 19th century scientist in the 20th century which allowed him to be that kind of polymath but one bit of curiosity i, I do just had to get off my chest the boxes because they they are kind of the the archetypal image is, is there is there any sort of still is there still any sort of Mass use of because I know if you go to the like Organon in um up north in the states, but like there, there isn't there isn't a mass use but mass use of anything with with right makes me kind of laugh a bit because there's so kind of little practical interest. But um, but the weird thing about the organ accumulator is it just works like how Rick said you sit in one, uh, what he said happens happens, which is normally. A subjective sensation of energy. Um, it feels like static electricity, but it isn't. Um, it feels like static. The closest sensation I have is like static electricity, but it isn't static electricity. Your temperature goes up. Um, you feel sort of a kind of parasympathetic relaxation, and that's what happens. Where when you sit in one, you can you can. I feel like I can feel it with my hands fairly clearly. Um, and when that happens, you just go, oh, right. Ah, oh. <laughs> this is what he was talking about. Um, but the, uh, the history, if you look at the history of the, um, because, <clears throat> uh, you know, if you talk to someone who doesn't know a lot about the subject, they'll say, oh, yeah, you know, but, but they have some passing knowledge. They'll say, oh, right, there's a crank and, that, <clears throat> and all that stuff was disproved. Um <clears throat> Uh, the FDA's trials back in the 50s um, were biased from the off and they've never been published, so we don't know what they proved. And that's the only kind of clinical disproof that I'm aware of. Um, I'm, I, you know, I, I don't think they've been subject to large-scale trials. Um, I'd like to see it one day, but um, with right reputation, I'm not holding my breath. Um, but I mean, I, I would say if you're interested, build one if you have the space. Um, I don't. I, I do not have the space. But um, I've I've sat in one at a friend's house who, uh, a lot, and I can attest it's yeah. They, 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 they work as he said. What one of the actually one of the really irritating Guardian level type of discourse about that is, but works if they will cure cancer and make you spontaneously orgasm and um neither of those things are true uh, yeah cancer cancer emission and spontaneous orgasms are um i hate to disappoint the listeners but um they're, they're, yeah they're not happening unfortunately right yeah will go ahead so uh i've got a less uh philosophically scientifically uh dense question have you heard the song Cloud Busting by Kate Bush? What do you think of the song Cloud Busting by Kate Bush? And does the sort of Cloud Buster as a machine, what, what is it, first of all? Uh, and what's its relation to the Orgone? Um, and... Um, yeah, how does it show sort of the vastness of Reich's, not only the basis of Reich's theory, but of his kind of eclectic uh, uh, pursuit? I, I would say absolutely. I would say, well, the, the song in Kate Bush in general is, is fantastic. Um, 
you know it's based on her reading um, Peter Reich's book, which is who was Reich's son. Um, uh, he wrote a book called A Book of Dreams, which is a little uh, mini autobiography about having such a strange father, and it, um, um, and that's what it, what it's about. She was quite pro Reich. Um, I posted something on Twitter that came out recently, a, a Hounds of Love um, uh, repress uh, in a, a nice box, and she's made this. She's made this really lovely film, which is meant to be. Um, it's meant to be Peter Reich um, talking talking about that song. Um, and that's what recent. So I assume Kate Bush is still uh, pro Reich, which makes her even cooler, in my opinion. If you can be cooler than Kate Bush, um, like the Cloudbuster, in a lot of ways, it's like the ultimate test of like credibility. Um, and um, I can't think of the right word, but it, it's it, it's kind of like. Can you believe in something so challenging? Um, it seems like a test to me of uh, um, credibility. The idea, not not credibility, not the right word, but um, it, it's almost like it's designed to to to, to 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 test how far one will go in one's in one in in one's beliefs. But having said that. Because of my experiences with uh, an org the organ accumulator, Reich has credit with me. You know, I've sort of, well, um, I'm not going to run around trying to convince people that Cloudbusters work and we can we can change the weather and all the rest of it. But it's been right so far. What I have seen is what I have seen is is convincing. So yeah, I'm, I'm I, I wouldn't I wouldn't dismiss the idea at, uh, at all. Um, but it's it's a challenging one, you know. Um, I don't really understand the mechanics of it fully. I certainly don't understand it well enough to um, uh, to talk about it. There's an excellent book called The Healing of Atmospheres. By Roberto Maglioni, um, which talks about Cloudbusters, um, and there was a guy he died a couple of years ago now, um, James DeMayo. He was in Texas. He was probably the, um, the leading authority on Cloudbusters. I know he'd made. He was uh, thinking if yeah he would. Well, he's he's a good case in point. What happens when you try and. Um, talk about Reich, um, I think he was refused his graduate diploma or something from the University of Texas because he because he was talking about Cloudbusters and I'm like, no. Um, and he spent his career um, looking into them as far as far as I know, but I don't I, I don't know that much about his work. But he's he would be the first person I would I would look at if I wanted to find out more. You have really reawakened my curiosity in the Orgone accumulator. I live in the woods, and I know exactly where I would build it. So I, I'm, I'm going to get on Google after this and see see what I can do as a summer project. But anyway, Dan, I just want to say thank you for, for being with us here today. It was a real pleasure to have you. Um, before you go, I'm just going to throw an assortment of three questions uh, out at you, and you're welcome to answer all of them or none of them. Um, the first question would be, as a Reiki therapist, or just as a therapist in general, what do you consider um, either your greatest or your most regular success with your analysands? Um, in addition to that, as most of us won't be going into Reiki and therapy, what do you think is really the best takeaway that we can get from an engagement with Reich on the page? And if you'd like, um, are you open to taking clients where you're at in London? And would you be interested in leaving your information with us? Sure. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, to answer the last question first, uh, yeah, of, of course. Um, <clears throat> I'll send you a link to my... Um, I'll send you a link to my current profile. Um, I'm in the process of, I've been setting up a website forever and failing to do so um, for a million, million reasons. But um, I'll send you a link to my current uh, BACP profile. Um, the second question, what, 
what would be the takeaway from Reich? Um, I think to think about your body and to think about your breath and to allow for the possibility of energy. Um, and just to... What do you get if you reorientate yourself towards your body for, for you know, and your breath in particular for a small period of time? Um, I think anybody could, I mean, breath work is becoming this, uh, it's become very trendy again. Um, and I think there's probably a lot of very interesting breath work practitioners out there. And I, I, I would, uh, um, I think it's something worth exploring and investigating if these ideas are at all interesting to you. There are a couple of, um, there's one book, Reich in Therapy for Home Use by Jack Willis um, and uh, Christopher Hyatt used his ideas in Undoing Yourself with Energized Meditation, uh, which is a sort of pseudo Reichian um, uh, therapy that people can work on at home. I have sort of beef with Jack Willis because he because he says, oh, Reich's ideas about energy were all wrong. But... Um, so, but his, that's an interesting book. Um, but if you do, if anyone does end up experimenting with this stuff at home, handle with care, it can be very powerful. Um, so, yeah, it can be. I was talking to a friend the other day and he says um, he can normally manage about three minutes of the breathing before he feels like his head's about to explode. So um, it's kind of hand, handle with care. Um, and what was the first question again? Your greatest success or maybe your most regular success that you experience in the counseling room? Um, I think I, I, um, I don't want to sort of breach confidentiality and, and talk about specific pieces of work with clients. Um, uh, I was pleased with myself recently when I managed to hold space, um, not really do anything. Uh, I was uh, with someone who's uh, psychotic, and I was pleased that I just managed to. Um, like writing, writing work is, is it's essentially about context. Uh, context, sorry, not context, contact. And I wasn't working with this guy in a writing way at all, but um, I think I managed to establish contact with him. And that was a piece of work afterwards. I was, I was, I was well pleased with what I'd done. Great. Well, Dan, once again, thank you. I think this has been informative and it's really satisfied my curiosities about the things that I didn't know about Reich. And definitely if you're listening, um, I've read the, I, all of us here have read the mass psychology of fascism. I highly recommend ether God and devil as a follow-up text to that. If you have already had a brush with Reich. Thanks again, Dan. We appreciate your support of The Imprint and the channel. Subscribe to Zero Books today on Patreon. Your material support helps us to promote a variety of perspectives on the left. Also, discover the many titles, new and old, that Zero has curated. Navigate to any of the links in the show notes to extend your support.